and uh, welcome to this home edition of uh, Politics Today, where we will be reviewing the major political stories of 2020. Um, three major stories really uh, dominated the headlines this year. They were Brexit, uh, COVID-19 and the US presidential election. But we've also had our freedoms curbed due to the global pandemic, COVID-19. So to join me on this news review of uh, 2020, I am joined by uh, Robert Smith, who is a lawyer at the Christian Legal Center, and uh, Tim Dieppe, who's head of policy at uh, Christian Concern. Uh, gentlemen, uh, warm welcome to the program. Um, I'll, I'll start off Thank with you, Simon. You. I'll start off with you, Tim. Um, 2020 has been such a dramatic year politically and uh, has affected all of us. Um, what are your thoughts looking back at the year that was 2020? Well, the main thing I think is I never expected it to be like this, Simon. You know, if you'd asked me for some predictions, and I hope you're not going to ask me for predictions for next year, but if you asked me for predictions back uh, this time last year, um, or the year before last, maybe, um, I would have never said that um, church, you know, uh, gathered Christian worship would be criminalized in, in this country for some months um, in 2020. I would have never, ever guessed that. And if you'd said it would happen, I would have said, no way, you're being outrageous. That's, that's ridiculous. That never happened. Um, and, you know, it's been, it's been a shocking year. And the extent to which, you know, you, you know, freedoms are restrictive, who you can meet, how many people you can meet, who you can have in your home, who you can't have in your home. Uh, all this kind of stuff. It's incredible, really. It's remarkable. And I do understand that people are afraid, but the, the level of restrictions is really quite alarming. And that's the thing that's really struck me most, really, in 2020. And um, Robert, so pleased that you can uh, join us on Politics Today uh, for the first time. Um, not only are you a lawyer defending Christian values through the uh, Christian Legal Centre, but you're also a fellow Arsenal fan, so you know, I have to like you. Um, <laughs> we all have our crosses to bear. <laughs> oh, definitely at the moment. Um, so Robert, can you just really describe uh, what kind of year you've had uh, in 2020 in, in defending uh, Christian liberties? It's been a very different year really because um we've grown fairly used to i suppose the, the the whole concept of having to defend street preachers in in the public square who get themselves in trouble for um for saying things that's now uh, that's that are unpopular we, we're used to that um we're used to seeing people losing their jobs for uh, for making comments which other people find offensive or it's woke to find offensive uh, that's part and parcel. We've been used to that for the past few years. But as Tim was saying, what's really different this year is the encroachment into our ability to worship. And uh, that's, that's seen a whole lot of new cases coming our way. So we've been challenging the government's decision to shut churches. When, they've, uh, when they first shut the churches back in, back in March, um, we decided to judicially review the government's decision. We thought that going that far was unconstitutional. Uh, we understood that there's a pandemic out there. We understood we needed to be responsible with our worship, but we've just felt that shutting churches was, uh, was the bridge too far. And so we challenged a decision and um, we were asked to withdraw that action uh, just before, um, because the, in, at the beginning of July, 4th of July, the uh, government announced that they were going to be allowing churches to open again. So they said, this case now just becomes academic. So uh, would you withdraw the case? So we withdrew it and we thought that was reasonable at the time, but of course then they went ahead and did it again. So we have another a judicial review outstanding at the moment, challenging both the decision to shut churches in Wales and to shut churches in, uh, in England. And that, that case is due to be heard um, in January. And um, Tip, I mean, what kind of year has 2020 been in, in terms of not only defending uh, Christian values against the onslaught of what we now appear to be a kind of militant, secular, humanistic ideology that is prevailing the kind of Western Western uh, Western world essentially and is is dominating the ideology in our, our media as well as in, in our parliament as well um, how difficult has 2020 been in in terms of trying to push back this tide of this liberal progressive agenda well I think that um, one of the things that really struck the headlines this year is free speech and um, the various issues around that whether it's allegedly misgendering someone or, or whether it's um, you know saying your view about marriage, or or whether it's you know an Eton teacher um, putting up a video uh, with um, views about men and women and so on, 
um, you know, there's been some real headline grabbers out there and some of our cases as well have hit the news um, around this. And there's been some real pushback, I think, for free speech. Um, and the launch of the free speech union has been some, you know, part, contributed towards that. Um, but also at the same time, you've got the Scottish hate crime bill, which is proposing to criminalize potentially what you say in your own home. Like you could, it could criminalize quoting the Bible in your own home. Uh, the Scottish hate crime bill could. And, the, um, and then you've got the law commission in England uh, who have got a hate crime consultation, which proposes the same kind of thing, you know, criminalize, you know, no, no protection for what you even say in your own home. Um, in that one um, as well. Um, so there are some real concerns out there and there's a real sort of battle hotting up out, out there in our culture around free speech and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and, but some wins and some pushbacks, but also uh, some real alarm bells as well ringing out there with these things uh, coming up on the horizon. I'm not surprised either signs like uh, we're back in the Soviet uh, Union times or under Soviet occupation or even worse kind of Nazi occupation. Once you uh, erode free speech, there's a great danger that our whole democracy and our democratic institutions and our whole personal liberty and religious freedoms would be under, uh, under threat with such dangerous legislation. But what I want to really dis discuss uh, Brexit now. Um, Robert, what are your thoughts on what has been a dramatic year in terms of Brexit? Because last year we saw that uh, uh, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson won uh, a huge landslide in the election in December of 2019. He got an interim agreement with the European Union. And as we count down the final days of uh, 2020, it looks like we could be heading for a no deal Brexit. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I think perhaps we'd be kidding ourselves if we thought that this whole negotiation process is going to be easy. Uh, you've got parties which have got quite different interests mm. and uh, and so accordingly the negotiations were going to be pretty hard uh, it's interesting that we're um, we've got this sort of going to the wire thing now um, we've had various deadlines when these uh, negotiations were supposed to be concluded um, but each time they've been hung on hung on hung, and, and they're still going now uh, it still wouldn't surprise me if we managed to pull something a, a rabbit out the hat before. I know it's going to be difficult to get Parliament to ratify anything now because we're really close to the end of the year. But it still wouldn't surprise me if uh, if we come up with something because it's in both sides' best interest to have some sort of an agreement. But I never envisaged this being a particularly easy passage. I mean, even after um, even after we voted to, to leave the European Union um, within our own Parliament, it wasn't. Uh, easy to get consensus. So to get consensus uh, with, with all of the other European partners has, uh, was always going to be fraught. And uh, Tim, Tim, many of our, our viewers, uh, are must, including myself as well, very much um, support uh, kind of Brexit and uh, coming away from the European Union for, for our own nation's sovereignty and our own personal liberties. And the, the fact that we won't be tied into uh, Europe as it moves closer and closer to a European super state. But from a Christian concerns perspective, what are your concerns? Um, because you've been able to uh, really have the assistance of the European Court of Justice to counter a lot of these anti-Christian cases that, that we've seen uh, in the UK. Yeah, well, I think it's the European Court of Human Rights um, that has sometimes ruled in our favor. And I think the most significant case of that was one of Shirley Chaplin, who some years ago uh, lost her job for refusing to not wear a cross. She wanted to wear a cross that she'd worn for many years. And, um, and it was a symbol of her faith. And the British courts and the British government said, no, 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 it's got nothing to do with your faith. It's just a piece of jewelry. You need to take it off. And it finally got to the European Court of Human Rights. And there, ex-communist judges from Poland said, yes, that is a Christian symbol. The cross is a Christian symbol. I mean, you know, we had the British government and arguing it wasn't. Now, so we have sometimes had some protection from that. Now, we're not leaving the um, Human Rights Convention as we leave the European Union, you know, um, and um, that may come later, I don't know. And there are issues around that as well with sovereignty, which I understand and respect as well. Um, but it's interesting to note that um, sometimes, actually, we've been helped by um, some of those European courts and um, we'll see where that goes. But I would prefer that our courts saw justice, really, than having to appeal to another court outside. And uh, Rob, I suppose the major political issue that has dominated 2020 is uh, the global pandemic 
COVID-19, where we've seen the government take extreme liberties off us in its fight against this virus, the, the likes of national lockdowns, restrictions, shops being closed, restaurants being closed, uh, people not being able to travel out of certain tiers. Uh, I'm in tier four, which is the, the most extreme measure uh, that the government can introduce in terms of dealing with this uh, virus. But um, what, what are your thoughts on the government's handling of the uh, COVID-19 crisis? Well, last, uh, last Tuesday, I was, uh, I was happily in tier two, ticking along quite, uh, quite merrily. But then by Saturday, I, all of a sudden, I was in tier four, and I didn't actually notice any particular difference along the way. But there obviously um, are things going on out there. I mean, some members of my family have had, had the COVID virus recently. So, you know, it, it is out there. It is, it is present. But how have the government dealt with it? Well, they've been following the scientific advice. And, uh, but of course, there are various schools of scientific advice that not all scientists are agreed on the way that, that, that this has been handled. But if they hadn't followed the scientific advice, then I guess that they would, uh, if, if this all goes horribly wrong, they, they're going to have the fallback position of saying, we followed the scientists. Mm. If, it, if it all sorts itself out, they can say, well, we're wonderful. So th there's a bit of... Uh, self-protection, if you like, in, in taking the advice. But I do think that the way that, think that they've gone about things has just been too extreme. Uh, as Tim was saying earlier, you know, you can't really start saying to people who you can meet, when you can meet, where you can meet, and all this kind of thing. We really are getting into a very, very dictatorial situation when you're... Um, of course, our behaviour has to change. There is a pandemic. But nevertheless, the way that you handle these things, uh, and I know you need the wisdom of Solomon to, uh, to really um, to, to come up with the right answers. And it's very easy for us to sit on the side and snipe and say government should do this, government should do that. But the reality is this is a disease which is affecting old people. The young people are not drastically affected by it. They get a bit of a, you know, they might lose their taste, lose their sense of smell or something like that. But it's not a young people's disease. And yet the reality is it's the young people who are bearing the brunt of it. They're the ones who are... Um, having their social lives completely curtailed. They are the ones who tend to be losing their jobs. And by the way, they're the ones who are going to be paying for this for generations to come. And uh, it's just very, very unfair, I think, the handling of it. Uh, so um, I, wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to be the person making the decisions. But, uh, you know, I just think that when people start talking about a social contract, that these young people have a social contract, I don't think this contract is a particularly fair one for them. And, um, uh, Tim, we, we've also seen that uh, during this... Uh dramatic year of 2020 uh, with the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I mean, I remember seeing this uh, emerge in January in China and uh, the, the Chinese government forcing Wuhan to actually close and then the whole of China. Not for one moment did I think that this would come here to our shores and then around the world and, and, and really bring the whole world to, to a halt. But during this time, we've also seen a fundamental attack on Christian liberties. For example, the, the government closing churches. Um, you've highlighted how the government is encouraging uh, uh, women to have DIY abortions at home. We've seen that uh, street preachers have been arrested in the streets. Um, what are the things that you've been dealing with that concern you most with the government's handling of COVID-19, particularly in restricting religious freedom across the United Kingdom? Yeah, th well, thank you, Simon. I think that um, the, the point about um, banning uh, churches from gathering to worship is, is a really significant one. I think what brings it home for me is that the government allowed churches to do non-spiritual things. So you could run a food bank, you could run a blood donation center, you could do some other social project like that. But if you did a prayer meeting in the midst of that, that would be illegal, right? If you did a worship meeting in the midst of that, you preached a sermon there, right? That would be illegal. And this is clear discrimination. It's clear discrimination against uh, spiritual practices. And the other thing that also uh, struck for me was that... Um, they said that uh, off licenses are essential and that um, bicycle stores are essential and actually worshiping the living God and praying to him for his mercy is like, you know, that, you know, we don't care about that. Um, we don't care about that. You know, so, you know, that, that was the thing that struck me. And I think it's very um, powerful illustration of where we are as a nation in terms of our respect for Christianity and our respect for Christian worship. Um, I'm very pleased that in the latest tier four, churches are allowed to meet. I think that's a really big win. I think the one difference between tier four and lockdown two is that churches can meet. And I think that's the government waking up and realizing 
uh, partly due to our legal action, partly due to other people like Theresa May speaking out quite boldly in Parliament about this, um, the government realising that, that that is a step too far and they shouldn't have done it. And I hope they don't do it again any anymore in this whole um, pandemic crisis um, that we've got. But um, it was it was quite striking that the government was prepared to do this. And I think it's, it's going to undermine our campaigning for religious freedom all over the world because countries that close churches will point to the UK and say, well, you close churches too. And we won't really have a good answer to that. And uh, Robin, uh, uh, sorry, Robert, you've defended um, really uh, street preachers who, have, who are on the front line preaching the gospel to what is becoming an increasingly more hostile nation to, towards the gospel. Um, share with us some um, uh, stories uh, regarding uh, street preachers being arrested for just sharing the gospel in the streets and of course practicing social distancing so when um, we do assist virtually every street preacher who comes to us we we will offer them assistance and we think it's very important that we do contest for their right to go out and preach some of what they say isn't popular but the gospel message isn't popular and the reason we fight for this is because they need to be able to say that in the public square, because if you can't, if you start restricting what people could say in the public square, it's only a matter of time until that will start to filter through and we'll have censorship in the pulpit as well. So we think this is one of those lines in the sand that it's really worth, um, worth defending. Now, some of these guys have got really big hearts and they go out come rain or shine and, uh, you know, they really want to share the good news of Jesus Christ. When the, um, when the lockdown, the first lockdown came about, uh, they were told that they couldn't go out because technically it's not for their, strictly speaking, it's not for their work purposes, although we're all co-workers with Christ to, to get those out. So you didn't fall within the working exception. And so people were trying to find ways around it. And uh, so, you know, we've had certain street preachers who've decided to go out and take their exercise and preach whilst exercising. So they go for a walk and they take their little... Um, a little megaphone with them and they preach while they're walking but a number of street preachers have been arrested they've all been very responsible these are not silly people you know they do position themselves away from um from the passers-by so they're going to be socially distanced from everybody and they share the good news but nevertheless um that they have been a, a number have been arrested one guy was even arrested on he was preaching from the back of his truck and uh, so he was well i don't know probably five ten meters away from anybody who was going to be anywhere near him and uh, the police officer actually got up onto his truck to arrest him. So these are the kind of uh, things which we've been uh, which we've been seeing. And the difficulty with some of this, you know, it's a lot of this is poor policing. It's not, um, you know, some of these things could be just handled slightly differently. The regulations are bad, but we've seen some really bad policing of it as well. Uh, and, and Tim, finally on, on this issue, only. Um... Only, uh, only a few days ago, we had the announcement from uh, Boris Johnson that, uh, that uh, millions of uh, people will have their Christmas cancelled due to uh, going into Tier 4, which is where I live in, in the southeast of England, uh, together with London and, uh, and other parts of, uh, of the UK. Um, is there a danger now that, uh, that our Prime Minister Boris Johnson will now be politically branded as the Prime Minister who cancelled Christian uh, Christmas for millions of people. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he did. And it's extraordinary, isn't it, that he did it three days, I think, after saying that it would be, um, um, what did he say, immoral or, or um, you know, it would be you know, so wrong to, to cancel Christmas, he said, just three days before. And then three days later, there he was cancelling it. And as Rob sort of indicated, um, these politicians are beholden to the scientists. If the scientists say jump, panic now, they're going to panic now because the risk of them going against the scientists and being wrong is just too high um, for them to stomach. Um, so, so th there we are. That's what happened. What, what, what um, I find striking is that Keir Starmer was calling for Christmas to be cancelled pretty much all through December, wasn't he? Um, and somehow, you know, people thought that was popular and okay uh, to do. And I think Boris really didn't want to do it, but when the scientists said jump, he jumped. Um, and, um, and that's where we are. And yes, he's going to go down in history as the Prime Minister that cancelled Christmas and um, disappointed so many people. Of course, it is only people in Tier 4 who have properly got it sort of cancelled in that way. But it, even in the rest of the country, I think you're only allowed to be for one day now, aren't you? Um, so, yes, I personally, I'm very disappointed. I was hoping to meet with a uh, wider family, expecting to, planning to, got it all set up, bought some of the food got the presents ready, et cetera. 
and um, and that's not going to happen. And I know for millions of people up and down the country, there's going to be great disappointment. Um, and and sadly, let's not forget great loneliness um, over this. People who are stuck in their houses, sometimes single single room uh, rented rented accommodation, been there all year, been working from the same room all year, wanting to go home for Christmas, and now they can't. I mean, you know, you've just got to reach out to these people and uh, think of them and not forget that um, it's, it's a big deal to stop people from meeting with their friends and family over Christmas. Yeah, ab absolutely tragic. And um, Rob, the, the other major political news story of uh, 2020 was the US presidential election, where President Trump and his administration stood on a biblical platform uh, compared to his, uh, his rival, uh, Joe Biden, and the uh, vice president uh, nominee, Kamala Harris, who hold very extreme liberal uh, progressive views that are essentially anti-Christian. Um, what are your thoughts on this very controversial US presidential election in 2020 in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, when, uh, when President Trump was first elected, I really wasn't sure quite what we were getting. Uh, I don't think anybody was. He was a bit of an unknown quantity, a bit of a loose cannon. Um, I wasn't fond of the way he was using Twitter, etc. But then um, as his presidency evolved, I was rather pleased with some of the things which he did. Uh, he's done a huge amount for the pro-life movement. And he's been, I think, his own spiritual journey has been quite an interesting one. I know that he's worked quite a lot with the uh, Franklin Graham's ministry and uh, has had an awful lot of very good advisors around him. I don't know what his, uh, his own personal spiritual journey is, but I, th I think he's been on one and, uh, and th that's been working its way out in, in some of the policies that he's been pursuing, but he has done a lot for the pro-life. And I think that interestingly, uh, the way that he has changed the Supreme Court now, uh, we've now got a conservative Supreme Court, that should set America in reasonably good stead for the time being, um, despite the fact that Biden has now been elected. I was disappointed that Biden was elected because as you say, I think it's, uh, it's very obvious that their, their agenda was nothing like as Christian as the Trump, uh, the Republican Trump agenda was and uh, and i think it's quite dangerous um having him there and furthermore i think that but with uh, with biden i mean it was it was vote him get her i suspect because whether he's going to last out the full presidency i think is anybody's guess and uh, and i think with her fairly rapid feminist views uh, it could be quite uh, quite an interesting few years for the for the states so um i'm i'm concerned should we say uh, and, and Tim, we, we've seen that uh, President Trump has been the only U.S. president ever to defend the unborn in the U.N. Security Council and has done so much to, uh, uh, well, so much to counter the, uh, the, the pro-abortion uh, lobbies. He's done so much to uh, protect prayer and freedoms. He, he brought 30,000 American Christians to pray at the return event in Washington, D.C. He's surrounded by uh, born-again evangelical believers in uh, Vice President Mike Pence, as well as Mike Pompeo. We had Nikki Haley as America's ambassador to the U.N. Um, with the possibility of, of, of Trump now not being on the world scene, what impact do you think this will have on, on Christians and the anti-God legislation that we expect to see the Democrats push through uh, if they are confirmed as winners in 2021. Yeah, well, I think that um, the world does look to America as um, you know, one of the leading superpowers, doesn't it? And um, the culture, yeah, the culture, the messages that come from that culture influence the whole of the rest of the world. And people look to that and see that. And I think if we get in America, um, laws passed that promote sort of identity politics and and hate crime and various other sort of woke agenda type of things, it will have a massive impact on not just America, but the repercussions around the world and, you know, and the pressure on other countries to follow um, America's lead, so to speak, um, in this kind of way. Um, so so it is a concern. It's, it's a real issue. Um, and, you know, we'll see how it goes um, at the same time, you know, if they start to implement these policies and the consequences start to come through, um, that could also end up being a warning lesson to other countries. You know. And um, uh, so Rob, we'll we have 
three minutes uh, left uh, of the program and uh, you know all our viewers uh, really have got to thank you both for the incredible work you both do through Christian Concern and the Christian Legal Center for actually defending our Christian values and uh, if you weren't there doing this vital important work I dread to think the moral and spiritual state that this nation would be in but um but Rob, how can our, our viewers get behind you as one of our top lawyers defending Christian values here, here in Britain? I think one of the things which we really appreciate is, is support. Um, now, the, the people who come to us are ordinary people. They're not special people, especially in God's eyes, because God's chosen them to fight the fights that, they are, that they're taking up. But, you know, they're ordinary people who, in their normal day-to-day -day lives, would never think of being propelled into the limelight and so we would it would really benefit us and them if you could pray for them pray that they'd be sustained through what they're doing now of all of the cases which we've done over the years people have, have come to us and all of them have said afterwards even if it's been quite destructive um a process you know and, and they've been through a fairly grueling time all of them have said they'd do it again and i think uh, so if, if your viewers can support them in prayer if you want, want to find out more about the cases go to christianconcern.com look up the cases and and but Pray for some of these people. They're very ordinary. They don't want to be being dragged through the courts. They don't want all of this stuff going on. But there comes a point where they feel they want to take a stand. And if we can get behind them with prayer, then that will make a huge difference to them. Uh, and, and Tim, how can we um, all support the, uh, the incredible work being done by Christian uh, Concern in bringing these such important cases uh, where our own Christian liberties have been at stake, especially as we head into 2021? Well, I would say um, sign up for our emails. We're going to do a free weekly email um, um, with news and, and information that your, your viewers will definitely find of interest and relevance and fuel for prayer. Um, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, and, um, and like our pages and, and all that sort of stuff. And just connect with what we're doing in those ways and, um, and pray and uh, support as you feel led and and make people in your church aware as well pass the emails around all that sort of stuff um just in, we just need to increase awareness of what's going on really Absolutely. so uh tim and uh robert thank you so much for joining me on uh, this uh, new year's day edition or new year's eve edition sorry of uh, politics today and thank you for giving us a review of all the dramatic events that we've all faced in 2020 and our prayers are with you we pray that you would go from strength to strength in uh, 2021 and thank you so much for all the work you do in defending uh, all of us uh, here where our christian liberties are seriously under threat and i just want to thank you all for watching this home edition of politics today i want to wish you all a happy new year and uh, we pray that uh, we'd all be up for the fight in 2021 because we face an unprecedented fight for our Christian freedoms. These freedoms are not guaranteed and it's up to each one of us um, to pray, to intercede and to express our Christian faith to what is a dying world. And so this is absolutely vital for every Christian living here in Britain. So I want to wish you all a wonderful 2021. Thank you for watching Politics Today.